Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. How will a new state law affect Seattle's efforts to criminalize public drug use? What's the latest on a plan to improve public safety and revitalize downtown? And what's next for the newly established Seattle Film Commission? I'm talking to Council Member Sarah Nelson and a special guest to answer these questions and the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. This is a crisis and the community, the city, I think needs a means of intervention. We have to have both a law enforcement and a social services response. They are always combined. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And here we are with Council Member Sarah Nelson and a special guest, John Scholes, the CEO and President of the Downtown Seattle Association, to help add some perspective. John, thank you very, very much for being here. My pleasure. And Council Member Nelson, always good to see you. Let me start with you, if I could. Help us get a broad picture of what the city is working on right now in downtown with the activation plan that the mayor launched last month. The idea was to crack down on drug dealing crimes, launch an expansion of Seattle Fire's Health One unit, which uh, with a focus on overdose response, and connecting with people who have substance use orders through what's called contingency management, providing incentives like gift cards if they're able to complete, complete some of the drug treatment services. Give us an update on how this is going so far. Those were all components of the executive order, and I stood on the stage next to Mayor Harrell and I endorsed that because we have got to focus on substance use disorder and expand the treatment services that are available. And I spoke specifically about the contingency management pilot project because it's new. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there's some talk about, oh, you're just going to give um, gift cards to people. Yeah, well, people have said you're, you're bribing people or something along those lines. What, what do you say Let to me that? tell you why this is new and important. It's because it rewards sobriety. These, so let's talk about how it's going to be implemented. Plymouth Housing is a partner, mm -hmm. and so those are people that will be enrolled in this program. It's not just going up the street and handing out gift cards, first of all. And second of all, this is a new approach. Contingency management is considered one of the most effective interventions in, when it comes to addiction, especially when paired with counseling and maybe following inpatient or intensive outpatient services. It provides, um, by rewarding sobriety, which is proved through a urine test, um, it, it provides a space for people to make a different decision about potentially going into treatment. Okay. And that is new, that is a new approach, and mm -hmm. that is why I think it's important that, um, that we try it and yeah. that we prove that it can succeed. Okay, got it. Anything so far, I know we're just maybe a month in, and any results that you can tell us about or we're still waiting? I believe that it is still in the, uh, the planning phase. The process, okay, yes. fair enough. Uh, John, I wanted to make sure I talked about what the DSA is doing here, the Downtown Seattle Association. You have your downtown ambassadors, very hands-on in the situation, administering naloxone, drug overdose treatment to 81 people since January, and that's just the start. I want to talk more about the DSA's role when it comes to drug activity downtown, and also your assessment of the city's efforts to revitalize downtown from that public safety uh, perspective to start, please. Yeah, the crisis around drugs, the crisis around fentanyl that's facing our city today, I think is the most significant crisis uh, in front of us. We've lost more people to drug deaths since March of 2020 than we have to COVID. The increase from 21 to 22 was over 70% when it comes to overdose deaths within the city of Seattle. So this is a significant public health, safety, moral emergency that we need to take on uh, with new strategies and new approaches like Councilmember Nelson uh, noted. There's not one answer. There's not a city around the country that's got the answer. So we've got to try some new things and we need to move with urgency. Uh, our ambassador team, which is about 100 plus individuals working full time in the downtown, began carrying Narcan in June of last year mm -hmm. on a voluntary basis. If they, if they wanted to do it, we would train them and equip them. Most of our folks are carrying it today. Since the beginning of this year, uh, they've administered it over 80 times. Our contracted private unarmed security also carries it, and so they've been administering it as well on top of the 80 incidents um, yeah. in administration that I yeah. noted earlier. So. Yeah. Uh, we're using it far more often than we'd like. The good news is we're saving lives, but the bad news is there's lots of people still out uh, using dangerous drugs, and we've got to take that head on. Thank you very much for that. Councilmember Nelson, the city has had an emphasis patrol of Seattle police 
officers around Third Avenue for more than a year now, which is really a, a center point in terms of this drug activity. And we got this email about the situation from Britt, one of our viewers, who writes this. What happens after emphasis patrols are done in the area and crime moves back? How do we make sure that we're not just moving people that are committing the crimes from neighborhood to neighborhood? This is a criticism I know you've heard before. Can you talk about that in terms of what's happening downtown and what you're trying to do there? Well, we, it's not just one action, first of all. So we have got to address um, drug use from a number of different perspectives. We already spoke about um, the uh, contingency management intervention, but right. we have also just dropped legislation to prohibit the public use of drugs. Right. And that is important because um, that is what's causing the negative impacts that people are writing to me uh, to complain about. And we've got employers that are saying that their workers don't want to return to the office because they don't want to get on the bus. I mean, King County Metro installed filters on buses to study the circulation of fentanyl smoke within to, to see whether or not it's, it's having a bad impact on the drivers. So, yeah. so this is an emergency, and so there is a law enforcement component and that is hopefully going to be stronger incentive to get people into treatment. Okay. So that is just one thing. We've also got to incentivize more businesses to come downtown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is something that the DSA has weighed in on. And yep. I think rightly, we have to do everything we possibly can to, to bring more business down there. That will add life to the street and it will also generate more general fund revenue so that okay. we can continue on these programs you've mentioned. Can you hold on that economic piece for just a second? Because I wanted to go back to that idea of the public use of drugs, and you worked on this, or you have been working on this with Councilmember Peterson. You had a press conference with a, a City Attorney Ann Davison not too long ago about this. And I wanted to put it in perspective because very recently before we recorded this show, the state of Washington passed this Blake bill fix, as it was called in the special session there. So this made drug possession in our state a gross misdemeanor. It also criminalized drug use and added $44 million in drug treatment statewide. And I was looking at this because you recently made this announcement that I think you want to keep pursuing this public drug use bill. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, if the state passed a law, why does Seattle need its own law? Because we're talking about misdemeanor offenses, which means that the city prosecutor files the charges. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there needs to be a law within the SMC giving her that authority. Seattle Municipal Code, keep going. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so things don't just automatically get integrated into our municipal code if it's our city officials that are going to be um, regulating it. And so that is why council has to act and create a law to give um, to give her the authority to, to work on these things. And it's not necessarily a decision to keep people in jail, mm. it's a decision to divert them to treatment or other diversion programs so that they can get help. Okay, thank you. And it, this is a very important distinction here because I get so many different comments about this and I know you have heard these too. John, I, I wanna bring you in here because there's always some disagreement about the use of law enforcement in these situations. I had one social media commenter write this when I posted about this. After five decades of the war on drugs and the deaths at King County Jail, do you consider prosecution the right tool to address substance abuse? I know the DSA was supportive of this city law and public drug use before the state acted. A lot of other business groups around the city said that as well. Do you still support this idea of a city law on public drug use? Yeah, I think the community, the city needs a means of intervention uh, to intervene in people that are significantly harming themselves using public areas to do so. This is a deadly poison. Uh, we're seeing more and more people die every year from fentanyl. The new versions of fentanyl trank that are coming into our community are even more deadly. People are losing their limbs, having significant wounds. So this is a crisis and the community, the city, I think needs a means of intervention. This is poison being peddled, possessed and used in public areas. And we regulate lots of behavior of what you can and can't do in public areas, on sidewalks, near schools, near bus stops. And I think the use of fentanyl should be one of those yeah. uh, that, we, that we regulate. Our ambassadors that do carry Narcan have been exposed to secondhand fentanyl smoke. Uh, uh, over the last several weeks, we've had three individuals uh, exposed. They have to then have Narcan administered to themselves. One of them spent the night in Harborview. So there are real impacts to the general public from uh, the public use of some of these very deadly and dangerous drugs. Got it. Hey, Council Member, yeah, please, yeah. Um, you know, we do have laws on the books that prohibit the consumption of alcohol and cannabis in public. But there has never been a law in Seattle um, to prohibit the use of other drugs mm -hmm. that are illegal. And our silence on this issue is a raising alarm from my constituents who want to know what are we doing about this. Mm -hmm. Can you help me out with that balance though between 
the tool of law enforcement and the tool of, of treatment. I don't want to say versus each other because I think they can work together, but I think there has to be a balance there. That's what I've heard from a lot of people too. Absolutely. And, I, and I think you would agree. Can you talk to me about how you balance that? And because I don't think the idea is to try to get as many people in jail as possible. No, it is not. We know that jail is a harmful environment for many reasons. We also know that it is the entry point into treatment for many people. And we know that um, in interaction with an officer on the street can lead to a, a, um, a pre-filing diversion. Mm -hmm. And we're spending millions of dollars on our law enforcement diversion programs. And so we do have uh, some of the infrastructure, the tools, the programs in place. And this, will, uh, this is another avenue to get people into the treatment that they need. Okay. And I will say that for those that, that say, well, jail's not the answer. We, we have to have both a law enforcement and a social services response. They are always combined. I can tell you, having been in inpatient treatment, a lot of those people got there from uh, a court order, from jail, from, a, you know, from another different program, but because there was a legal intervention. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. I think John. we have to acknowledge, too, just how deadly these drugs are. I mean, that is a difference from where we were in the 1980s yeah. in this country. And if we had people climbing to the top of the Space Needle today, sitting on the edge and then jumping off, we would intervene as a community. And that is, in effect, what we have when we have so many people using fentanyl and even more dangerous uh, versions uh, on our streets. Yeah. And their chances of death are high. If you've overdosed once, your chances of dying are even higher. So this is a serious public health emergency. It's costing lives. It's costing a lot of money. Thank you for that. I want to switch gears, if I can, a little bit, Councilmember Nelson, and talk about what's happening on the business activation side of things. You touched on this earlier, because I know the city's working hard to fill up vacant office spaces downtown. City Hall Park is set to reopen in June. Other initiatives there as well. And I wonder if you could keep this question in mind. We received this via email when it comes to revitalizing downtown. Jimmy wrote this. What success metrics do you think are important for the city to strive for? How do we measure those? I want to try to talk about this, the overall plan for business revitalization, and how will you say this is a success? You can measure this as a success this summer and going forward. Well, I think a success would be uh, the number of people that are circulating downtown. Mm -hmm. And the Seattle Times ran an article last week, I believe, talking mm -hmm. about, I think it was at about 40%. John would know this yeah. better. Mm -hmm. That is lower than most cities across the country. Right. And You're talking uh, about uh, offices and people returning to work compared to pre-pandemic. It's tracking cell phone data. Yeah, so it's right. it's both workers and visitors and, you know, people going to school, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, so that would be a metric. I want to see that number go up. I want to see office vacancy rates go down. Right now it's 22%. That is, that's bad. Yep. And it's up 4% from uh, a year ago when it was 18%. Mm -hmm. So that is another, um, that's another metric. Return to work, employers can tell you how many people are, are coming back to work. And right. so all of these are, um, are statistics that we can track. But I also think it's a feel. I think it's a feel that you get from downtown and there are, you know, downtown is a, uh, is a vibrant place right now, thanks largely to the work of the ambassadors and DSA, what they're doing to activate public spaces. And we've got the All-Star Games coming up in about 50 yeah. days. And so it's, hand, it's, it's up to us policymakers to create the conditions for people to want to come downtown. And so it's the downtown activation plan and mm -hmm. some of the items in there and, and more will be unveiled in the, in the next couple of months, according mm -hmm. to Mayor Harrell. Yeah. But it's also public safety, yeah. first and foremost. People okay. have to feel safe yeah. downtown. Thank you for tying those together. And John, let's try to dive into some of these numbers because I know you were glued to the screen every day when we talk about the downtown recovery dashboard that DSA has available right now, especially that returning to the office piece. The May figures, as I've seen them, show that we're just above that 40% office occupancy uh, level compared to pre-pandemic times. This does not show, however, the impact of Amazon returning a lot of workers to the job on May 1st in South Lake Union. What are the numbers telling you? The first week of May when Amazon returned, we had more people working downtown relative to the same period in 2019 than we've had since the start of the pandemic. So we're headed in the right direction. It's been a slow and steady uh, return to office. And we know that more employers uh, are sort of following Amazon's lead and bringing workers back into the office at a similar rate of three or more days a week. Redfin made an announcement, DocuSign, other downtown employers. So I think the pendulum has really shifted away from majority remote work, which is where we've been in here in Seattle over the last 
you know, three years or so, and employers and employees, I think, are seeing, again, the benefits in, of, of being together in person, maybe not five days a week, but a majority of the week. And we think we get back to a majority of people back in their offices a majority of the week. Uh, we think that's good for downtown, but can also be good for workers, good for culture, good for uh, organizations and, and companies. And we've done a lot to create a much better environment downtown for workers to return. Uh, the first three months of this year, crime is down, uh, violent crime is down 28% compared to the first three months of last year. A year and a half ago, we had 150 tents around the sidewalks and public areas downtown. Today, maybe 10 or so. Uh, so the streets are more welcoming, healthy, safer, cleaner for everybody. Got it. And I wanted to make sure I touched on a headline that might have passed under the under the radar for a lot of folks, and that's the Metropolitan Improvement District. Mm -hmm. The council worked on reapproving this, and I think this is kind of one of those stories behind the story here. Can you talk about this? You sponsored this. This is a big part of making sure that there are ambassadors and other uh, activities downtown. Can you talk about that piece, please? Yeah. Well, downtown wouldn't be what it is, what we know it to be right now without the mid. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that we all owe a, um, a debt of gratitude to the ambassadors and also to the ratepayers, the property owners sure. who have agreed. They, are, they asked to charge themselves money to clean our streets, remove graffiti, give tourist directions, yeah. um, you know, staff the summer parks, uh, mm -hmm. concert series, et cetera. Yep. And so there's so much that the mid does for downtown. I can't imagine downtown without it. And yeah. so, yes, that was an easy sell. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine <laughs> a lot of To renew it because, yeah, yeah. because every 10 years it, it right. is up for renewal. Got it. Uh, John, some thoughts about the mid. I, I think it's one of those, again, stories behind the story that not a lot of people know about, but this was a big deal that a lot of those property owners said, even in the dire straits that some of them are in uh, with the amount of dollars they've lost over the past several years, they're saying, yes, we want this. This. Talk to us about the mid and what it means. Yeah, I think it shows the optimism that property owners have in downtown's future, that our best days are really ahead. Yeah, we've been through a tough couple of years, but there's a lot of bullishness about what's to come, and we're grateful for the support of Councilmember Nelson, Lewis, and Mayor Harrell to make sure this got authorized. But about 1,250 property owners said, yeah, keep charging us, and, and more so, we'd, we'd actually like to contribute more for cleaning, safety, security, concerts, events, activation, beautification in our downtown. So we'll go from collecting and spending about 15 and a half million dollars this year to about 18 and a half next year. That's going to mean more cleaning, more feet on the street, more events, more parks and public spaces that are activated. And getting those basics right has always been important to creating a, a safe and healthy city, a place where people want to go spend time. So yeah. it's great for visitors, workers and residents and we're going to see more of it starting in July. And, and I have something yeah, please. to add there because these are jobs. Yeah. These are actual jobs with benefits, mm -hmm. with um, I believe starting salaries $20 or something like that. Yeah. And you should have seen the energy, the positive energy in chambers when this was discussed in my committee. <laughs> you can check it out on the award-winning Seattle you channel. You better believe I don't it, yeah. Dates. But mm -hmm. my point is, is that small businesses, mid ambassadors, mm -hmm. business building owners, residents, they all came forward and said, this is absolutely important. Yeah. We appreciate this work. Yeah. Please pass this. Okay. I, I need to start wrapping up with the both of you. And maybe Councilmember Nelson, you can give us a view of where are we going to be on this revitalizing downtown discussion? Take me a year from now. Do you have some thoughts about that? There's a lot of plans in place right now. How is this going to, what's this going to look like a year from now? It's going to look even better. Look, we, we, um, we are planning now for the All-Star Games. That's in 50 days. Mm -hmm. Next year, we'll be planning for the World Cup. Yeah. All right, we've got we've got a brand new convention center, and 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 so there is a lot that's positive that's happening right now. We have got to implement the programs on the books, and 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 at the same time make sure that we're delivering the basic service of public safety. Okay, thank you, John. Some final thoughts about where we might be in terms of downtown safety, in terms of downtown business next year. Yeah, I'm encouraged. Clearly, we have a lot of work left to do, and clearly we're still in a fragile spot, but really encouraged with the progress. Just this month, we had about a dozen uh, announcements of new businesses, reopened businesses, or businesses that will soon open, you know, restaurant, retail, uh, bars, cafes. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more activity at the ground level of downtown, the things that people want to go do for fun mm -hmm. uh, that are important to draw on people back. And then we've got some of these big milestones that Councilmember Nelson Nelson mentioned, and, and, and those are going to be terrific. Our summer is going to be gangbusters with the record crew season. Mm -hmm. Conventions are back. Uh, big concerts, big sporting events, of course, uh, All-Star Week. So 
Uh, and, and we're going to be much closer to opening things like the Waterfront Park, which is going to be right. a game changer. And I yep. think, you know, if you haven't been downtown in a few years and you still haven't been downtown, this is going to be the reason you kind of reintroduce yourself to downtown, yeah. open in 2025. So we're cutting the ribbon on a bunch of major moves and major projects that have been in place for, you know, in some cases, two decades that other cities would just die for. And we've got a collection of them here to open to celebrate uh, and I think they're going to help fuel our recovery. All right. Well, we'll see what happens over the next few months and next year as well. John, thank you very much. I really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. And I'm going to ask more questions of Councilmember Nelson one-on-one -on -one here. So you stay right there, and we will be right back. This summer, the city of Seattle wants to fill up 20 vacant storefronts in downtown and throughout the city with pop-up shops, events, and art installations. Want to learn more? Check out seattlerestored.org. And we are back with Council Member Sarah Nelson here on Council Edition. Thanks for sticking around here. I wanted to talk about trees with you. I know this has been a very contentious issue for the Council. Here in May, you're going to be passing a set of new regulations intended to protect trees and also preserve housing development. And I think you bring a different perspective to this because this is something the Council has been talking about a long time, maybe back even when you were a legislative assistant under Richard Conlon many years ago. But you are one of the newer Council members here taking a, taking a look at this, maybe with some fresh eyes here. What are you seeing here? Where have you tried to guide this conversation? Well, it's funny you mentioned Richard Conlin because, yes, I was a staffer. He was actually the council member that formed the Urban Forestry Commission. Right. Right. And so I was working for him from 2002 to 2013 with a couple years break in there. Yeah. And back then, um, it was, I hate to make myself sound like uh, the old person who walked <laughs> 10 miles to the snow. Sure, sure, it, you sure. Know, but, but basically, um, it was almost inconceivable that we could regulate trees on private property. And so look how far we've come. Mm -hmm. That is the, pers that's one of the, a part of the perspective that I bring that this, this is, when you look at the conversation back then, this is new. Yeah. And I have to say though, that this has been an active conversation for the years before I got here. So I had a lot of um, bringing myself up to speed and it was really a difficult process because mm -hmm. there were about, I don't know, 40 or 50 amendments oh, yeah. that we had to digest at the last minute. Mm -hmm. So I, I went in knowing that uh, trees are beloved, and they um, and people are very emotional about trees, as am I. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're never going to be able to preserve enough, uh, according to the the people that know these things. This yeah. will result in the uh, protection of I think about 57, 58 thousand more trees than it had we done it otherwise. Okay. At the same time, we've got a housing affordability crisis, right? right? Yeah. And T so, tell me about that balance. I know. That, yeah, I know. that's the it's, toughest it's part difficult. with this. You know, yeah. I, People like to say it's not trees or housing, mm -hmm. it's both, and I believe that. However, the devil is in the details. Yeah. And I think that um, what, the, what the builders of housing wanted, and these aren't big developers, these are the people that, that build the homes that, that people live in, mm -hmm. you know, single family homes, yeah. et cetera. What they needed was some certainty about how they could um, how they could build on a parcel of land. Yeah. And up to this point, there if there was a tree there, they had to figure out how they could get the far in that limited space, et cetera. And that yeah, was yeah. taking time. The floor area and, ratio. Thank you. Right. Keep going. And that was slowing down the production of of, of much needed yeah. housing. Right. And so that is that was the tension that we went into this legislation with. Mm. And as um, Councilmember Strauss said in the very beginning. Pretty much everybody has a complaint about this, yeah. and so therefore, um, th maybe we're doing the right thing. What I said after that marathon day of amendments, I, I actually said that I felt um, really ambivalent, mm. and I still do, because mm. uh, precisely because of the difficulty of talking about living, um, our living plants that yeah. are that beautify our city, that that cool our climate, and um, uh, yeah. Anyway, that are that are rare. However, they do grow back, or they yeah. they can be replanted. Sure. We have to take the long term. And so, I guess what I'm just saying is that I understand the concerns on both sides, and I think that we came out with um, with a piece of legislation that did its best to answer those concerns. 
Thank you for that. I wanted to move on to something else, the Seattle Film Commission. You and I talked about this <laughs> last year on Council Litigation. Right. It seems like just yesterday you brought this up in committee back then, but now we have this 13-member board finally been set, starting to meet. And the backstory here, folks, there's some state money, new state money out there that lets Seattle offer some tax incentives to entice film crews to come here so we don't have The Last of Us set in Seattle, shot in Vancouver ever again. Uh, tell us about this commission, what it's going to do, its top priorities moving forward. Right. Well, I love working on something that is non-controversial. Let yeah, me right. just say, <laughs> sure. I mean, because this was yeah. a priority coming into office because I yeah. learned how important the film yeah. industry was to um, to jobs, economic growth, right. and to advancing um, equity, as well as forming a pipeline for young people mm -hmm. who want to work in the industry. And we're losing those people yeah. to Portland and to uh, yeah. to Vancouver to the north. Yeah, cost of living is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's also because there's more opportunity in right. those cities okay. because yeah. they have invested in their film industry by mm -hmm. having things like a film commission. Yeah. What does that do? Why is it just not another commission? Mm -hmm. It's because it shows that, that local government has skin in the game and we are trying to make it easier to make film here, not just for outside production, but for our already existing uh, people in the industry and the talent that lives right here. Got and it. so this will be an 11 member um, commission mm -hmm. and they represent every single segment of the film industry from mm -hmm. on-screen talent to post-production editing everything in between. We've got labor, education, and of course we've got a representative from SIF. Right. And so we need industry experts yeah. to tell city policymakers what we need to do to make it easier to make film here so that yeah. we can reclaim our natural position as the as the best filmmaking city in the nation. And, and you brought up SIF there, the Seattle International Film Festival, which is going on right now all around Seattle here in May. It just seems like an exciting time to be connected to SIF and, and see, to see this industry start to grow because not only are we talking about the festival, but, but SIF purchasing the Cinerama Theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, this seems like a very interesting time to get involved in this industry. What's, what's your insight there? What, I can only explain the energy in the room when that was announced. I was there on opening night, and when Tom Mara, the new director, uh, unveiled this news, the excitement was palpable. People got on their feet. There was a roar of applause. And so that just shows you how meaningful it was to open, reopen this iconic uh, theater and also to have it in the hands of the venerable um, SIF. And yeah. so that is the last star in the alignment of many stars uh, to advance our mission of, of, um, of boosting film here. Yeah. You mentioned the incentives, those right. $15 million, that was 13 million new dollars to incentivize film production. That doesn't, that's not quite Atlanta or Vancouver, mm -hmm. but it is, it's more and that's at the state level and I thank Washington Filmworks. Then we've got Harbor Island Studios, right. the county's investment in a sound studio, yeah. state-of-the-art sound studio, which we have not had since 1996. Mm -hmm. Now we have a film commission that puts Seattle on the map and shows people that we care. And now we have this uh, th this venerable, iconic yeah. theater that's going to reopen. It's it's massive news, and I I guess I'll wrap up with one quick question for you here. So, if a filmmaker had to make the movie. What council member Nelson is doing this summer? What would that look like? Is it just one shot of you watching the Seattle Channel, or what do you got? <laughs> Gosh, it's it's me going to a lot of meetings. Yeah, <laughs> frankly. Um, okay. So uh, that is a, that I'm going to have to roll that through my Please, mind. But I know. but I I did sit in a movie uh, okay. to watch the um, the showing of uh, Year of the Fox. Oh wow! Okay. And that I went to that, and that was fun because the director and cast members and production crew got up there on stage, answered questions, mm -hmm. and that was fun for me. And okay. so, if you were to just ask, what is the movie of Sarah Nelson in the next <laughs> couple of weeks? It's more of it's that. It's watching more movies. Yes. Right. Councilmember Nelson, thank you very much for being here, and we'll see you next time on Council Edition.